to the Oak Bend family, to any others that might be joining with us today. For myself and our worship team, we want you to know we're so glad that you are with us this morning. As we get started, I'd like to turn our attention first to the Word of God for a moment. I want to look a little bit at Psalm 113. The psalmist wrote this. He said, Praise the Lord, you his servants. Praise the name of the Lord. Let the name of the Lord be praised both now and forevermore. From the rising of the sun to the place where it sets, the name of the Lord is to be praised. The Lord is exalted over all the nations, his glory above the heavens. Who's like the Lord our God, the one who sits enthroned on high, who stoops down to look on the heavens and the earth? He raises the poor from the dust, and he lifts the needy from the ash heap. You know, each Sunday we come together to worship, and this psalm is all about worship. It reminds us when we should worship, but it also reminds us why worship is important. This psalm reminds us that worship really isn't just for Sundays. He says the name of the Lord is to be praised always. It's to be praised every day. It's to be praised when times are good and when times are difficult and unsteady, like we're walking through right now. But he also reminds us of the reason we need to worship. And I know that we can think of probably a number of reasons, but one here I think is particularly important when we're going through difficult times. He reminds us here that worship is what gives us the right perspective. When the psalmist here comes to worship, he begins to realize who God is. He talks about God being exalted over the nations, his glory over the heavens, he says he sits enthroned and he has to stoop down to look on the heavens and the earth. Worship helps us to grasp the greatness of God. When we get alone, when we take some time to just focus our heart and minds on God, we really begin to see 
how big he is, how awesome he is, and the fact that he is in control of the world that he's created. But it also is a reminder to us that God cares about all that he's created. The psalmist said here that he raises the poor from the dust and he lifts the needy from the ash heap. God cares about our lives. God cares about our circumstances. God cares about what we're going through. And he is a God that is willing to stoop down to us and help us, even though he is so great and awesome. And so as we come together to worship today through music and around the word of God, let's ask God this morning to help us to see him as he is and to ask him to help us in the areas of our life where we need it today. Pray with me. Heavenly Father, today as we come together to worship, Lord, you are worthy of praise. You are worthy to be praised from the opening of the day to the closing of it. You are worthy to be praised in good times and in bad times. And Lord, as we gather on this day to worship you, I ask for each one of us that you would help us to see you afresh again. Your greatness, your glory, but also your goodness to all of those who reach out to you and seek you. Help us to realize and see that you are a God that cares for your creation. And as we come together today, may we pour our hearts out to you. And I ask that through your Holy Spirit, you would touch our lives in the places that need your work today. Father, may our praise to you be pleasing. And Father, would you touch us today and help our lives in the areas that need it. I pray and I ask that together with your church this morning. Amen. And amen. Second Corinthians 517 says that we are a new creation. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has gone, the new has come. Tell yourself the truth this morning. Who are you in Jesus?
Well, I want to thank our worship team for leading us in worship by song this morning. And in just a little while, they'll come back to lead us again. But we're going to kind of turn this morning and we're going to worship. But we're going to do that as we gather together around the Word of God. So I want to invite you this morning, if you have your Bibles, and I hope that you do, to take them. And I'd like to invite you to turn with me to the book of Ephesians. This is the letter from Paul to the Ephesians. We've been making our way through this letter. And this morning, we're going to begin in chapter 4. And so I'd like to ask you to grab your Bible and turn there with me. Ephesians chapter 4. I heard a story this week about a mom who got up one morning to make pancakes for her two boys. Uh, one of her sons was named Kevin. He was age five. The other was Ryan, and he was age three. And as she began to make the pancakes, the wonderful smell began to spread throughout the house, and the boys came a-running, and they jumped up to the table. But no sooner had they got to the table than they started to argue about who was going to get the first pancake. And hearing their argument, mom thought, you know, this is a great opportunity to teach them what the Bible has to say about things like sharing and putting others before yourself. And so mom turned to her two boys in, in as sweet as a voice as she could muster. She said to them, you know, boys, if Jesus were sitting at the table, he would probably say, let my brother have the first pancake. I can wait. Well, everything got really silent for a few moments. And then the older boy, Kevin, looked over to his younger brother, Ryan, and he said, Hey, Ryan, you be Jesus. <laughs> well, you know, I love that story, and it highlights something that's all too real for us many times. And that is that it is far easier to talk about Jesus and talk about Jesus' teachings than it is to put them into practice in our lives. It's far easier to talk about theology than it is to walk the theology that we talk about. And yet the reality is what we talk is actually to inform the way in which we walk. The one is meant to guide the other. And in the passage before us this morning, that is really the challenge that Paul is giving first to the Ephesians and then to you and me by way of this letter. We're in Ephesians chapter 4 this morning. I want you to pick up with me at verse 1 and notice what Paul writes. Paul says, As a prisoner for the Lord then, I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling that you have received. Now you might recall, if you've been with us in this series, that the first three chapters of the book of Ephesians is, is almost entirely doctrinal. In fact, in all three chapters, there's actually only one command, and that is the command to remember something that's found in chapter two. Basically, chapters one through three are all doctrinal. And in these chapters, what Paul is doing is he is reminding us of our calling. He's reminding the Ephesians of what it means to be called by God. He's reminding us what it means to be called by God. He's reminding us what God has done for us. He's reminding us the new identity that we've taken on as the people of God. He's reminding us of the grace and the mercy and the gifts and the power that have been given to us to live the life that we're called to live. And so Paul says, now look, in light of all that God has done for you, in light of all that God has given to you, Paul says, live a life worthy of what it means to belong to the Lord. Live a life that reflects your calling as one of God's own people. Let what God has done for you now shape how you live your life corporately, and also individually. And I want you to note here that this isn't something that Paul just comes at casually or takes lightly. Paul says, I urge you. In other words, I'm pressing this up on you. I'm laying this up on you. This 
It really isn't an option for the Christian life. It's a necessity that you live a life worthy of the calling that you received. And then starting here at verse 2, and really through the end of the book, what Paul does is he begins to unpack what a life worthy of the calling that we have from God involves. And so this morning, we're going to begin to look at what that life involves, what uh, a life worthy of that calling involves. And this morning, we're going to just look through the first six verses here, and then we'll pick up other things that it involves in the week ahead. So look with me at verse 2, where Paul begins to let us know what a life worthy of the calling involves. Notice where it starts. Paul says this, be completely humble. A life worthy of the calling, Paul says, it involves, first of all, humility. Now, humility was not a highly valued thing in first century Ephesus. And I think the reality is it really isn't a highly valued thing in 21st century America. I think about 21st century America, it seems to me that we're more into getting our 15 minutes of fame, or we're out there letting everybody know about our lives and what we can do and what we've done and what we have. Uh, humility isn't one of those things that we think a lot about or value very highly in our culture. And yet the reality is God values humility very highly. Now listen, humility is not having a low opinion of yourself. It's not this, I am a worm syndrome, I am so bad, I am terrible, I am rotten. It, it's, it's not, that's not humility. And it's not humility either to run down the accomplishments that God has allowed you to have. Uh, when we think about humility, it really doesn't have anything to do with thinking less about who we are as a person or what we have done accomplishment-wise. What it has to do with is thinking a little less of ourselves than we think of other people. You see, when humility starts to take root in my life, I will not be the first person that I'm thinking about. When humility starts to take root in my life, my cry will not be first, I got my rights, it's my right, when things don't go my way, or I'm put out of my comfort zone, or I'm put out doing something that I really didn't want to do, but I need to do it for the need of another. See, a person who is growing in humility is the person who is thinking less about themselves and starting to think more about others and what might be best for them, even if it's an inconvenience to yourself. And really what Paul calls us here to do is to imitate the Lord Jesus. Philippians chapter 2 records for us that in the life of Jesus, maybe the thing that marked him the most was his humility. And I want you to hear a couple of verses about the life of Jesus from Philippians 2. This will be familiar to many of us, but here in Philippians 2, beginning at verse 6, Paul writes this about Jesus. He says, Who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself, by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Paul says Jesus came to earth, and when he came, he clothed himself with the garment of humility. He saw the bigger picture of our salvation than just his comfort. He was willing to be inconvenienced so that you and I could be helped and blessed. He looked to our interests, to our needs, and not merely his own. And if anybody 
had the right to take up his rights, it would have been Jesus. And yet, Paul here reminds us that he laid aside his rights for our better good and the greater need that we had of salvation. Now, Paul says here in Ephesians, you be completely humble with others. Paul says, now you live with each other the way that Jesus came and lived for you. See, a life that is worthy of the calling of a child of God is a life that is marked by humility. Now, from humility, Paul moves to a second thing, that a life worthy of the calling involves. And by the way, it wasn't valued in first century Ephesus either. Look at what he says in verse 2. He says, be completely humble and gentle. What comes to your mind when you hear that word gentle? I think for numbers of people, a couple of things come to mind. We think of somebody who is could be soft-spoken, but many times when we think of gentle, we think of somebody who is weak, somebody who's more like a doormat that you're just allowed to walk over. But this word that Paul uses here for gentle has absolutely nothing to do with being weak or being a doormat for other people or even lacking strong convictions and opinions. The idea behind the word that Paul uses here is it's a person who has the ability to keep their emotions, particularly anger, in check. Even when they're in a situation where they're right, but it isn't working to their advantage. It's, it's a word that talks about maintaining our composure as we discuss uh, differences and issues with other people without becoming unglued on them, or having an outburst on that person where you absolutely shred them with your words. Paul says, be gentle. And when I think about this word, I'm going to tell you one place that I think it really needs to be brought to in our culture today. And this, this affects a lot of Christians. And also, we could probably toss in some humility. And that is the way that we interact on social media. And, and I've watched this. It, 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 and here's the thing. It is easy to sit behind a screen and tear a person to pieces whose view that you don't agree with. And yet, a couple posts later, I see those same people talking about God and his goodness and his greatness. And I want to tell you, those two don't go together. Listen, you can disagree with someone. And the truth is, we will disagree with someone. We'll disagree with each other at times. And sometimes you may be in the right, and the other party may be in the wrong. But here's the thing. Paul says, you can still agree to disagree and do it in a way that allows you to maintain your composure, honor that other person, and not dishonor Christ. Paul says when you deal with other people, when you deal with each other in the body, do it gentle. Because that's exactly how Christ is with us. He is gentle. He doesn't just rip us apart and, and tear us apart when we come to him and we've messed up again. He's gentle. Yes, he might correct us. Yes, he might instruct us and speak truth to us. But he does it in a way that honors us as a person and helps us as we move forward. Paul says, look, those of us who are to live worthy of our calling, we do that by being humble. We do that by being gentle with others. And then Paul mentions a third thing that a life worthy of the calling involves. He says, be completely humble and gentle and be patient. Now that word patient, 
Um, sometimes we've heard it called long suffering, and that's the ideal behind it. It's the ideal of being long under something or being long with somebody. It's, it's the ideal of taking the long view of a situation and being willing to work on it or work with it and work through it. And how we need patience today because we live in a world that is so quick to quit on so many things. I mean, we quit on relationships. We quit on marriages when it gets tough. We quit on a job when we don't like the way things are. We, we quit on church when things don't go our way. We, we quit sometimes even on God when God doesn't work things the way we would like him to work or as quick as he, we would like him to work. But Paul says here, don't be so quick to quit because everything isn't going your way. He says, look, if you want to be worthy of your calling, you stay with things. You work through things because that is the way Jesus did. You know, the Bible tells us that when Jesus came, life was certainly not easy for him. And in the final week of his life, as he was moving toward the cross, you might recall that in the garden, he cried out to the Father and he said, if it's possible, let this cup pass from me. But he also said, not my will, but your will be done. And he pushed through and he stayed at the work God had given him to do. You know, that's the way Jesus was with those first disciples. If you remember those first disciples, there were a lot of things that they did not immediately get right. And a lot of times they argued who was going to get the biggest seat in the kingdom, who's the greatest, who's going to get first place. And Jesus didn't push them away and push them out and quit on them. Jesus worked with them. He stayed with them. He kept teaching them and admonishing them and correcting them. And by the way, that's how Jesus is with you and me. Jesus doesn't push us away when we fail. Jesus doesn't push us away when we mess things up. Jesus is patient with us. He's long-suffering. He's committed to working out our lives here and the salvation that he has begun in us. In fact, Paul even says this over in Philippians chapter 1, verse 6. He says, He that began a good work in you will carry it on to the day of completion. You see, a person in the family of God who wants to live worthy of their calling is patient with others, long-suffering, staying with it, working through things to the glory and the honor of God. So Paul tells us, be completely humble and gentle, be patient. And then he gives us another thing about a life that is worthy of the calling. He says it involves love. He says here at the end of verse two, bearing with one another in love. You know, love is one of those things in our day that I think has come to mean so many things that sometimes it really doesn't mean anything at all. But if you want to boil down biblical love to its, its basic ideal and meaning, biblical love is wanting and it is doing what is good for another person. It's wanting and doing what is good for the other person, even if it's at an expense to you. And really what, what love does here is it wraps all these things together. When you love, Paul says, you are humble with other people. When you love, you are gentle with other people. When you love, you are patient with other people because you want their best. You want what's good for them. And when you love, you're humble and gentle and patient. Love is kind of the garment that wraps all of these things together. When I love, this is what love looks like in a body or to other people. It's marked by humility, gentleness, and patience. And then one last thing that Paul mentions here that a life worthy of the calling involves, he says it involves unity. Look at verse 3. 
He says, make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called to one hope when you were called. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. Not hard to miss the key word there, is it? It's one. There's one body, Paul says, and one spirit and one hope and one Lord and one faith and one baptism and one God and Father of us all. One. It's a reminder to us that God's not divided. God is not pulled in different directions. His mission, his kingdom, his cause are not divided, and neither are we to be as his people. I read this past week about Abraham Lincoln. And Abraham Lincoln, uh, during the time of the Civil War, one of the uh, most difficult time, times in our country's history, during that time, one of the interesting things was that he had one of the most diverse presidential staffs or cabinets that anybody has really ever had. He had on it people from all different political parties. I mean, he was Republican, but he had Democrats on it. He had people on that party or on his presidential staff and uh, cabinet that were of all different temperaments and makeups. Uh, they came from different backgrounds. They had a lot of different views about uh, the way the country should do certain things and, and move forward on certain things. And yet all of those people came together to be one of the most effective presidential staffs in presidential history. And together they aided in bringing the country through one of its most difficult times and winning victory. And it was because all of them were focused on a single goal together. And that was they all were working for the greater good of the nation to keep it together as one union. And really when I read that, I thought that's, that's exactly how we're to be as the people of God. Unity is not about uniformity. It's not about all of us looking the same. It's not about all of us coming from the same background. It's not even about all of us liking the same things as, as we live life here below. It's not having about the same taste in music or politics or a lot of other things. What it is about is you and I coming together and putting all of those things in the background and putting our personal agendas in the background and focusing on his bigger mission, his bigger kingdom, and his bigger cause. And that is the cause of the gospel, making Jesus Christ known and the hope and the future that is in him known. And that is important any time. But you know what? It is especially important in times like we're in right now. I mean, if there is a time when the people of God need a unified voice and focus, it is right now when anxiety is high, when death is in the news every day, when things that people have put their hopes and trust in are being shaken. And we as the people of the God have an answer to these times in the person of Jesus and in his gospel, which speaks of hope and of a future, and it points to things that neither time or circumstances can shake or change. But the reality is that sometimes, instead of speaking in unity about Jesus and the gospel, we fall prey to the fear of our times, we fall prey to the squabbles of our times, and we fall prey to the divisions of our times. And when we do that, we miss our time of opportunity. See, to walk worthy of the calling that we received is to walk in unity together, focusing on his bigger cause, his bigger kingdom, which, by the way, that's the kingdom that's going to last forever, and leaning upon his ability and his powers to carry that out in our world today. Paul says, 
I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling that you have received. Let me ask us a couple things this morning. How are you living your life today? As a child of God, does what you profess match up with your walk? Does your theology inform your action? How are you living life today? Is it worthy of the calling you've received from Jesus? Are you being increasingly marked by humility, gentleness, and patience? You know, sometimes as the people of God, we use the wrong markers for whether or not God is at work in our lives. Sometimes we use the marker, is everything going my way? Are things going good? When it comes to church, we think about how many attend and how big services are. And look, there's a place for those things. But if we really want to mark how we're doing as the people of God. Paul gives us some great markers here. Are we being increasingly marked by humility and gentleness and patience? Is that what we see and show with each other? Is that what we see and show in our world? And finally, it's worth thinking about this morning, whose kingdom whose agenda is at the forefront of our lives as a church and your life as an individual. Let's pray together this morning. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you this morning for all that you have done for us. Reaching out to us bringing the gospel to us in the life and work of your Son, Jesus. Father, thank you. At great expense to you, you did what we could never do for ourselves so that we could be redeemed and a part of your family. Father, help us to reflect what you have done for us in our life, Lord, we don't do that so that we work for our salvation. We do it because we have received your salvation. And we are your people in this world. Father, help us to recognize that you have put us here to be a beacon of hope. To be a beacon that points toward truth and points toward a place of peace and steadiness, a very unsteady world. But we do that best when we reflect well the calling we've received. Help us to do that as a church. And help us to do that as individual believers. We ask this through the power of your Holy Spirit today and by our Savior Jesus. Amen and amen. Well, I'm going to ask you to join me right now, and our worship team is going to lead us in song.
Well, I want to thank you this morning for joining myself and our worship team. Thank you so much for joining with us as we've worshiped in song and around the Word of God together. Again, to our Oak Bend family, let me just say, as your pastor, along with Pastor Dustin and our elders, uh, if there's any way that we can minister to you, we certainly want uh, to be available to do that. Please reach out to us and let us know. And let me encourage you this week uh, to reach out to each other as the body, to care for each other. And I know that you've been doing that, and I want to thank so many of you that have been doing that and reaching out and, and thinking about others. And also uh, for the way that you've been giving to our outreach to the Toledo Gospel Mission, thank you to everyone that has given, whether that is money or goods. Uh, thank you for that. I know that that's been such a blessing to them. Well, let me encourage you this week to live your life worthy of the calling that you have received. And by God's grace and willingness, we'll be back together around the Word of God and singing praise to Him next week. Until then, take care. Have a great day.